Hey, everybody. I'm Captain Tommy Scoville, and you are on the lifeboat. What's happening? Yeah, I love this internet. Uh, so, hope everybody's having a good day. Uh, it's been a good one around here. I've had a lot of crazy things happen. It's been a very, uh, very busy day. I'm going to bring you all up to speed on it a little bit later because uh, I'm not... It's going to be one of those announcement things, but I'm not going to announce it right now. It's uh, it's going to be announced a little bit uh, a little bit later. But I wanted to talk today about truth, and uh, this is one of those wicked heavy subjects. You know what I mean? Because for the most part, none of us are very good at telling it, right? I mean, as addicts, we're not worth a fart because uh, you got to lie to to remain an addict, right? You can't. You can't get wasted. Let everybody know that you're wasted. They, they tend to get really uh, worked up about it. And then people do everything they can to try to take away your buzz. And as an addict, most of us don't really uh, don't want anybody taking away our buzz. Right? So we spend a good deal of time lying. And then when we get sober, it's one of the hardest things to uh, the, the hardest of the habits to put down is the BS. However, it's an issue. And I'll tell you something. It's kind of an issue now. You know what I mean? I mean, it's always an issue. But Bizzle, what's happening, my man? Uh, it's always an issue, but it's kind of an issue now. I'll tell you why. Here's what happens every single day. I work with people who are trying to get sober. By nature of the fact that they are trying to get sober, they're not sober yet. Right? So there's an excellent chance we're going to get lied to by them. It's not the end of the world. It's super hard not to take it personally. It really is. But until someone is sober, um, the drugs are calling the shots, right? This is not, this isn't one of those situations where it's the individual and they're just being jackasses. If that were the case, they're very easy to write off. But good God, man, you should have seen me when I was in the life or anybody else that was in the life for that matter. But you know where you got to draw that line? You got to draw that line after people get sober. You feel me? If, if you start lying to me after we get sober, right? We're going to have a real short relationship. I promise. It's going to be a painfully short relationship. Because what you're saying is, <clears throat> I kind of think you're stupid and I can get over it on you. For real. I kind of feel like all of that stuff you talked about, the street smarts and all of that, that's all BS. Right? And with the time you spent out there breaking the law and hanging out with criminals and going to prison and all of that stuff, I got more street smarts than you do. <laughs> right? That's what you're trying to, to pull over. And I promise it's not going to happen. So everybody, as far as I'm concerned, has got a get out of jail free pass because I haven't made this speech in a really, really long time. So if you're working with me, been working with me for a while, just started working with me, whatever. Right? But here's a good, here's a real good rule of thumb. If right now you're going, oh my God, I think he's talking to me. I probably am. Because there's only one of you. <laughs> but no, but for real, as a rule of thumb, people, we are going to have to deal with people who lie to us all the time. We are. And our gut says, write these people off and throw them out of our lives. Uh, the reason that you just can't do that, sadly, um, is because the, they're not at the helm. Right? They're not steering that ship. I promise you, it's just not how it goes down. I mean, I wish it were. It would be a much easier job. But there was a guy here uh, in the very early days of the boat. And the uh, the dude said, uh, you know, you pick a country that's got a really crappy leader. How about uh, North Korea? Right? The people in North Korea aren't dirtbags because of that dude. Right? Well, I kind of view drugs the same way. Like, if you show me somebody that's seriously addicted to an opioid. Right? I'm going to show you a dictator that's running that person's life. And that dictator is going to call the shots. And that person's going to do whatever they have to do to keep feeding that habit. And if that means lying, right? If that means BS in the socks off of somebody, they're going to do it. And I promise you, it ain't personal. <laughs> May sound really stupid, right? But it is not personal, man. Woo, we're getting there, man. Eight months. That year mark is coming. It's coming, dude. Yeah. Yeah. That 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 lion stuff, man. It's one of the hardest habits to break, too. 
make no mistake, it's one of the hardest habits to break. Why? Because we did it every day. You did it on the days you weren't getting high. Okay? You did it every single day. You did it five times a day. You did it 10 times a day. If you asked me what I was doing, right, for the first 46 years of my life, my answer was a lie. Because I couldn't tell you what I was doing. What I was doing was busting the law. What I was doing was drugs. And I was going to tell whatever lie I had to tell. I was going to have to do whatever I had to do, right? Stealing, whatever. Most assuredly, I can. Toss me up a uh, question about journaling and I'll lock it down for you, I promise. You know why? Because I'm on fire about now. All BS to the left, people. Every once in a while. Every once in a while, right? I fire on every cylinder and I'm having a hell of a week. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm really having a hell of a week. We could pull this thing right back, I promise. But you throw up that question because journaling is a fairly big deal. By the way, I got a... a uh, I've got an announcement I'm making about journal, our journal at the end. So don't ask me any questions about that journaling because that one I have an, I do have an absolute announcement at the end. To stop lying, I had to keep my mouth shut, says Subi. Boy, I get that, hon. We do I get that. I'm not joking you. If, if, if Johnny were in here, he would tell you that I had said word for word what you just said. I said, guess what? I got to shut up because if I'm talking, okay, I'm not going to be telling the truth, man. I got to shut up. Lisa Black, welcome to the lifeboat. We're glad you're here. And now you're no longer new. Welcome to the fam. For real, glad that you're here. It might be the yoga. It's You know, there's a couple of things. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm taking a medication that is, uh, I'm taking a medication that your doctor isn't going to write for you. Uh, because I have um, the, the neurologist I'm working with because of that little uh, that thing I got going on upstairs. This is a medication that has not gone all the way through all of the FDA approvals and all of that stuff, but it's doing really great stuff for me. You know that? Um, hey, dip me in glitter. How are you? Good to see you. It has been a hot minute. Well, we're glad that you are here. Uh, dopamine is the hardest to kick because of the slow process naturally producing dopamine on its own. Christy, this is rugged, right? This is really rugged. Um, Naturally producing dopamine on your own is rugged. Depending on what drug you're taking, right? Depending on what drug you're taking. The Let's say you're taking meth, right? Let's say your drug of choice is, uh, is speed, crystal meth. You're getting high on mad amounts of dopamine, mad amounts of brain chemical, right? Your body is releasing more brain chemical than it ever should, right? Under no circumstances should you ever have that much dopamine, that much uh, oxytocin, that all of the feel good, everything that literally the same chemicals you get when a doctor hands you your baby, except times 40, right? No one's ever supposed to have that much uh, kicking through their body at any given time. But uh, when you kick meth, your body does not want to start letting the dopamine out, even if it's, even if it's storing it up, even if it's the stores of dopamine are getting replenished for so long, you've been telling your brain, just chill out. I'll tell you when to send it. Right. And then you push down the plunger or you take the hot rail or you, you know, 10 and two, 10 and two, 10 and two, wh however you're getting down with it. Right. You do a bump, but once the stuff gets into your body, right. That's what it's doing is it's, it's doing what you normally would get when you pet a cat. Right. Or you go and you play with your kid. I'm sorry, squirrel. Did I bum out your sleep? You spoiled little. That cat is some other kind of spoiled. Miss Sunrise Dawn, thank you so much. Five of you have just become ensigns here on the lifeboat. Welcome. Good to have you. Tampa B, there she is. I struggle. There you go. Oh, yeah. See this? Um, there you go. I struggle to write anything in a journal. Uh, when should I try to write? Are there suggestions to get me started? You betcha. We're going to start tonight before you go to bed. We'll get you started right now. There are two times I think that you should be journaling, right? Now I'm going to tell you something. This turned my life around. Two times a day when I think you ought to be journaling. The first time is when you get up in the morning. Here's the theory, right? You thought I was going to say, here's the deal, didn't you? <laughs> here's the theory. Nah, seriously, here's the deal. 
you have a night shift and you got a day shift. Okay? During the day shift, you're conscious, right? You're walking around, you're doing things. You're at work, you're talking to people, the girlfriend's calling you or the boyfriend's calling you, whatever you got, it's happening during the day, but something somewhere along the way grinds your gears, right? A person at work says something passive aggressive or whatever, and it just makes you angry, right? Or your boss does something and you walk out of there without saying a word. Why? Because you know, you work in a, one of those cubicle farms. And if you go and start yelling, right, it's not going to do a whole lot of good. Um, oh, hold on one second, if you could. Let's handle this one here real quick. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to pop back uh, to that just in one second. My heart is hurting tonight, working through a loss of a close cousin. Pajama Pixie. Yeah, I saw that when you were over uh, on, uh, on Reese's channel. I'm so sorry for your loss. I really am. This is for uh, this is for you. That's um, I'm glad. I'm glad that we can can be of some assistance. I really am. Uh, and we're gonna have some laughs before the end of this. I promise. So the day, so you're working the the uh, the day shift, and you're so let's say it's your boss that you're pissed at. You're not gonna tell your boss you're pissed. You're not gonna lose your job. You're not gonna go through any of that, right? You're not. So what you do is you, you just put it away Then you go home and you walk through the door and your boyfriend is there, or your girlfriend, Hey, how you doing? How was your day? And you don't want to say, boy, let me tell you about the screw that I had to deal with and just start dumping on your loved one. Instead, you give them a hug and a kiss and say, ah, oh, it wasn't all that bad. And you forget about it. You put it away. Stuff we don't deal with doesn't go away. I got news for you. Things we don't deal with doesn't go away. The idea is that as things go by, we're supposed to look at it, deal with it, let it go. Look at it, deal with it, let it go, right? We are a streaming service. <laughs> we are not a, uh, we're not a recorder. We're not supposed to be recording anything. No DVR. This is just streaming through. Sadly, we DVR stuff. And then it comes back to haunt us at a later date. Always. You know, it's, I've told the story a million times here on the boat, but you, you see something and you go, I'm not going to talk about this. Looked a lot like a girl I used to date or your or your wife looked just like my wife. She was in a car with a guy, but couldn't have been her. It just looked like a similar car. And you don't say anything about it. Hell, I divorced her. It's 15, 20 years ago, right? Not a part of my life. But I see a white car going by with a blonde girl in it. And the guy in the passenger seat's wearing a leather jacket. And they're leaning close to each other to kiss. And I am 20 years back and in the worst headspace I've ever been in. And the crazy thing is, I know that woman wasn't cheating on me but I didn't deal with it at the time and things will come back on you again and again. Same thing in a much smaller scale during the day. day. So before you go to bed, because you're going to hand off what happened during the day to the night shift. That's when we dream, right? That's the night shift. That's the unconscious mind. But we don't want to hand them a day's worth of crap. Here you go. Dump the whole box on the table. Try to put that into some kind of a dreamscape. Make this work so that I feel normal in the morning. Good looking out. Hey, mom and Emma, what's up? That doesn't work. So you got to get your day into some kind of an organization. So you sit down and you start writing stuff out. Here's what happened during the day. You go, oh, you know who pissed me off today? My boss said this, this, and this. You write it out. Well, maybe that's enough. Maybe now, maybe the night crew doesn't even need to work through why Angela made you angry. Okay? But whatever happens, when you go to sleep and you get into that rapid eye movement, the night shift takes over and it starts dreaming. Sadly, there's no schedule. They don't say, okay, we're going to wake up at... Um, Seven, so we'll quit dreaming at 6.45. That should have you fairly normal by then. Doesn't work like that. So when you wake up in the morning, you got all of this stuff going on in your head that doesn't make any sense. So get right next to the side of your bed, have your journal. Just pick it up the second your eyes open and start writing. I don't care what comes out. It doesn't even need to make sense. Write the words that are in your head. Don't think, oh, what happened last night? Write mambo dog face to the banana pad. Right, whatever comes out in whatever order it comes out, it doesn't need to make sense, it doesn't need to do anything because later on, as you read this stuff, all you're doing is literally an info dump, whatever's in your head. Why? Because you don't want to walk through the day with that. Clear it out, do this for 14 days, and watch what happens. I promise you, right? I promise you. Now, I saw something back here. Here we go. My transgender child has just got uh, has just gone to the transgender floor at the Los Angeles Men's Central Booking. Just wondering how much I should put on his account and how often. Now, I'm not trying to to, to do anything that's going to get anybody in trouble or any of that stuff. 
right? But here's a decent rule of thumb. I promise. It's difficult, right? If you're if you're asking for more than say a hundred dollars a month, yeah, then what you're doing with that money isn't buying hygiene and eating, right? If they start asking for a hundred a week or a hundred every other day, just know what you're putting that money on there for, right? If you're comfortable putting money on to get somebody high, I'm not being disrespectful, but a hundred dollars a month, I've done a lot of time. $100 a month will take care of your hygiene and your food wherever you're at. For real. You're not living like, you know, you're not living like our Kelly, <laughs> right? And there with a fat with a fat bank account. But I mean, even in the federal system, you can only spend $360 a month. If you're filthy rich, you can't spend more than that. That's it. Right? You cannot spend that's it. Then they break it into two into two uh, different 180 blocks every 2 weeks. But you can't spend more than $180 every two weeks. You can't spend more than $360 in a month. So, I mean, I guess if they're eating viciously, you could be putting $300 a month on there. That's a lot of money, though. Man. I guess I've been out a while, $100, $100 a quarter. I don't think you need to put more than that on. Look, if you have a job in the feds and they're paying you, you're not making $100 a month, not until probably the second year you're working there. You make $19 a month in the beginning. That's, that's your uh, base pay is $19 a month. When it goes to the next level, it's $29. Then the next level is 50. So, I mean, most guys in there are living on way less than $100 a month. So that's probably the answer to that. Um, and it's a really good indicator of how your kid is doing in there. Because if your kid's asking for money every other day, and if they ask you, hey, I want you to put this money on someone else's books, they'll have a story of why. Uh, they, they were, they, I got into a pushing match with a guy and I broke his radio. Or I got into a pushing match with a guy and I broke his MP3 player. Um, you know, there's always something that you accidentally broke and it's going to cause a fight or it's going to cause a riot. Or you, I, I, I gambled at a poker table. Most most poker tables ain't letting you get on there with no money. Um, and certainly if it's just as a rule of thumb, right? Don't be putting. If, if, if you're putting money on people's books, you're helping them continue to break the law. hundred a month, I promise, in the jail, in the jail will take care of them. And. The good news is that he's on a transgender floor. That really is good news. Um, I would feel very uh, comfortable with that if I were you. I really would. Uh, there are places in America where that hasn't caught on yet. And um, I think it would be a, a tough thing. I'm glad that he's on a transgender floor. As a parent or family member of an addict, is helping them being a contributor? And I think the answer is yes. So uh, what is a person to do that loves the addict to help them most. Piper, here's the deal. Um, helping them is not keeping them getting high, right? That's not helping them. You can help them all day long. I promise you, you can, right? My son is the um, is the producer of my show here, right? Spanky. If, uh, if I think Spanx has a drug habit, right? I'm not going to give him a dollar to buy drugs. Not a chance. I'm also probably going to move in with him or I'm going to drag him here. I'm not gonna, I'm gonna make sure that that person is is with me. I mean, I really am. But this is what I do, right? Uh, but like tough love, tough love is I'm sticking my finger in you in the the loop of your belt buckle, right? right here, right on that loop. I'm sticking my finger there, and for the next six weeks, you and I ain't leaving each other's side. You're not gonna like me, I promise. Right? There will be times you are gonna pray that I die, especially if what you're kicking is an opiate. Because you're going to want to get out of there to go get high. And I'm not going to let that happen. Right? That's tough love. And it sucks. And they're going to vomit all over the place and defecate all over the place. It's going to suck. It's going to be the worst eight days of your life. And, and, and literally, it's going to scar your soul. It's the reason most people don't hang for it. It's literally going to scar your soul. But it's what you do in tough love. It's hard. But buying them drugs, here's the, here's the, the exception to that rule. Here's the exception to that rule. If I got a friend and they say, um, Tommy, I want to, I want to do this. I want to quit. I'm dead serious. I want off this crap. Let's do this. And I get him through the process and we, we get in there. This happened on two different occasions and we would get all the way to the finish line to get them Suboxone to find out that there's two days left on their prescription from their pain specialist. So they can't get on Suboxone for the next 48 hours. I let this cat into the wild for the next 48 hours. I'm not going to see them ever again. 
promise. Or if I do, it might be a year down the road or six months down the road or whatever. So in that case, I probably will buy that dude a bag, right? So it doesn't take off for real. I'll probably keep that dude well, just enough, right? So that he ain't sick. And then the following day, I'll do it again, right? Because I don't want him taking off. When that window opens and someone's willing to get sober, that window doesn't stay open a very long time, right? It doesn't. Now, the bright side, they open, they close, they open, they close. Usually not a one-shot deal. But that means you got to stick around and wait for the next time that it's open. And not everybody can do that, you know? But when someone's ready to get sober, you got to do something to help them get sober. Oh, hey, how you doing? Scared the hell out of me. Sorry, scrolling up. Hey, Tommy, I've been prescribed GABA, Pentin, 300 from my back, and told I'll need to titrate up to about six and then nine. Can you give me an idea on what I should look for as, uh, for, as far as being abusive? I'll be honest. I don't think, um, Lisa, that you got a whole lot to worry about in the uh, in the six to nine range. Um Again, like I was, the gabapentin now seems to be very uh, de rigueur that they're doing these 300 and 600 and 900, like the 300 um, increments. We used to get 800s when we were inside. The big ones were 800 milligrams, not nines. Um, But they do make a 900 now. But we would get eights and I would get four of them um, and then get four more and they would do that throughout the day. And uh, yeah, at, at... at 900, I don't think you're uh, you're going to feel it. I really don't. Um, if you're taking 900 a day, so you're taking three, well, one 300 uh, milligram tablet three times a day, I honestly, Lisa, don't think you're going to feel anything. If you find yourself unable to shut up, right? I promise you, the first sign you got a buzz on gabapentin, and I've watched this happen to a, a lot of people because this was a super abused drug in prison. They no longer allow it in the federal prison system. They removed it off the formulary because opiate addicts like it, you know, and then if there's no other option, then that becomes like, that was a very popular drug and they took it off the formulary. But um, yeah, the, uh, one of the things that you will find, one of the first uh, side effects, first symptoms is that people cannot stop talking. You could always tell if your cellmate was doing it because they, you'd be like, oh man, you've been eating those things. They literally will not shut up. You know what? Uh, Look, during the day, I journal throughout the day all the time. I really do. I carry a small book with me so that if I have an idea or whatever, it's a beautiful little journal. It's actually made by by Pajama Pixie. I carry it in the inside pocket because if I I don't remember things the way I used to, right? Um, Now, having a little, uh, and, and, and I journal during the day about ideas I come up with and things like that, or if something bums me out, if I'm an, if something really, really bums me out, uh, what happens is then I'm going to end up. Um, may I ask a question that may sound rude, says Lori Swenson. I'm going to doubt it's rude. Usually when people start with that, it's never really rude. May I ask a question that may sound rude? What made you take that first hit? Was the fear of drugs not a thought? I was always afraid, but my son used meth for a long time. Um, it's a great question, by the way. It's not, there's nothing rude about that question. It's a great question. Um, so the first drug I tried was weed, right? And I'll be honest, I don't have any idea why I why I was not afraid. Maybe because I just knew that weed was not a big deal. You know what I mean? Like I I didn't consider weed a, a drug, I guess, honestly. Um, now, how did I get addicted to heroin? Um, you know, what, what happened to me is I had a lot of injuries from uh, being a skier, a lot. And I really racked my body up. And uh, because of that, I was on pain medication for really, really long periods of my life. I mean, years and years on end where I just was always on pain meds. I would, there was, I've had, I don't know, dozens of surgeries. I've just been literally, you know, dozens and dozens of surgeries uh, from, from skiing. I mean, my knees done, my shoulders done, compound fracture of the wrist. These three bones were replaced. Uh, broken collarbones, um, torn rotator cuffs, uh, everything you could do. Broke my neck, broke my back. You know, freestyle skiing is a really rugged sport. And I took a lot of medication. And toward the end of my career, OxyContin was just really starting to come out. And uh, I went to a pain specialist that said, you, can, you can't get addicted to this. She literally said, you got to try to get addicted to this. 
didn't take much effort. <laughs> and then when the insurance companies cut you off, you know, you have a habit and you get so sick without it. It's incredible. And uh, the people that sell the stuff for a living, it's not like other things, right? You don't need a massive, massive uh, client list. These people have to buy their habit every single day. So I got up to about $700 a day that I had to do. I mean, how many of those people do you need to make a decent living, right? I'm spending five grand a week. Uh, it doesn't take a lot of guys like me, you know, to, uh, to make a good living. But they descend on you, you know. They come down and they're slick. They said, uh, oh, man, no, you're sick off of those, those pills. Everybody was sick off the pills. We were all getting cut off. The whole country was, you know, everyone that was taking this stuff. The Sackler family, uh, Lori told the world that you couldn't get addicted to this. And people with headaches were taking it. People with menstrual cramps were taking it. I was taking 12 Oxycontin 80s a day. They told me that was okay. Nothing to worry about. Can't get addicted to it. Oh, I got so addicted to doing it. It was friggin' incredible. <clears throat> and I had a really good job. Made a ton of money. I was the president of a public traded company. I worked as a public speaker. Like I had good gigs until I didn't. And that's how the, the disease progresses. And then the next thing you know, you're robbing banks. <laughs> Sounds really dumb, doesn't it? <laughs> Sounds stupid saying it. I'm not going to lie to you. I feel pretty stupid saying it. But that's how it, that's kind of how it ended up. Uh, listen, journaling can be difficult. Yeah. It can be. Christy Hughes, thank you. Journaling can be absolutely difficult. But you know something? You can trick yourself, right? You can absolutely trick yourself. I do this all the time, right? You can you pick anything throughout life, right? Because what we're trying to do in, in the concept of journaling, you're either talking about what's going on in your day to day. So you organize your thoughts and you keep things um, in perspective. It's fantastic to write. It's like going to a counselor after every day, sitting down and what does a counselor do? They're not talking a great deal. They're asking a bunch of questions, right? So how does that make you feel? Right? Really? Well, what would you do differently? <laughs> I mean, it's not, I'm not picking on them, but let's be honest. It's a lot of questions. It's not a lot of answers. The answers come from you. So you can journal your own answers and then you can do that. And then the other part of journaling is peeling that onion to try to find out what it is that makes us want to continue to get high, right? Or overeat or starve ourselves, or whatever the uh, other things are. I say I'm going to journal, and then after one day I quit, says Sherry Kelly. Okay, here, let me tell you, you know what, we're going to we'll, we're gonna break up this a little bit. So we have problems with the printers and the journals, right? So here's what we've come up with, for real. We are going to, uh, we're going to offer this book in two different ways, and one of them is going to be a digital download so that we can get it as cheap as humanly possible into the hands of people. This is the journal. And what our journal does is it lays out for you every single day um, what a subject matter is that you would write about in the morning and in the night. And it would lay these things out for you so that you can journal. And it walks you through a kind of innocuous process where you're journaling about things that don't seem to be particularly important. It's just kind of, kind of questions to get you talking and to get you kind of comfortable into the process. And then about every sixth or seventh one is an onion question. These are those questions that get you to start thinking about things that, believe it or not, very, very on a low key basis without doing anything that's going to make you feel weird is going to start pulling stuff out from your past that's going to make you go, huh. huh. So the question might be um, tell me the, the, uh, about the first Valentine's Day you can remember. No one's hot's broken on the first Valentine's Day. You can remember those are those are things you drop off on kids' desks, right? And you had little little candy hearts and silly stupid things. But what it does is it starts getting people thinking about times in their life that they don't think about. When's the last time you sat down and meditated about elementary school? When's the last time you tried to come up with the name of every single teacher you had from first grade through twelfth and write down a couple of characteristics about each of them? You try doing that and memories are going to jump off the page at you. You're going to think about, oh, I remember that teacher. Do you remember the time so-and-so? And you're going to start doing all this crap in your head. And this is how you find places and things that you had literally shoved out of your head. You shove them out of your head. When you're a kid and something's unpleasant, right? You do what you can to forget it. Unfortunately, very often... You kind of got to get to that part of the onion. Your boss is horrible. You should be able to fill pages. That's the spirit. Rip that, uh, that boss up. You know what, Blake? You nailed this. 
The best part of having a journal is reading it, right? Reading your own journal is the business, right? Reading your own journal is the business, especially if you happen to be in recovery or if you're working through anything, right? Um, I've been really open and honest. I've been in, I've been in uh, relapse for months, <laughs> for months. And I've been trying to dig out of the funk. I'm not, I'm not using, I'm not getting high. I'm not doing any of that stuff, but I'm not going forward. And I guarantee you that if you are in recovery, you're going forward or you're going backwards, right? There is no, I'll just put my foot on the brake, pause here for a few moments, wait for the light to turn, pull out. You're either moving forward or you're moving backwards. There is no, there's no neutral. There's no coasting. And I just haven't been moving forward, which is a bummer, but, but. I am very much uh, in the process of going back through to find out exactly where it was. I went, you know, at what point did I, did I veer off course? Because things were going pretty good. You know, um, Geo Planet Jane, Jane says, Lyrica works better than Gabapentin. That was my experience as well. pre gabalin works better than Gabapentin. So Gabapentin's name brand was Neurontin. And I thought Lyrica worked better. But it had some side effects that I was not particularly stoked about, right? Um, Roxy, uh, if gabapentin ceases to work um, for you, I would talk to your doctor and ask them about Lyrica because it's a, another drug in the same family. It's a very, very similar similar drug, uh, pregabalin. The one problem I have with Lyrica is, uh, for me, all I had to do was read the label on the bottle and I put like five pounds of weight on You've never, ever seen something make you get gain weight faster than that drug. I mean, just awful. Uh, da, 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 sorry. Present girl, goodness gracious, thank you. Good memberships, people. The boat is turning green. Um. Christy Hughes, thank you so much. You are uh, you are too kind. Please be safe and have fun with your uh, with the fam. Be safe, and we look forward to seeing you on the next one. God bless. SPTV Tattoo Warrior, thank you. Goodness gracious, you guys really are on fire. Nice. My daughter just talked to a teledoc today to stop vaping. Good for her. He gave her Lyrica and uh, Chantix can't be uh, written over Zoom. I'll be damned. Uh, and she had to talk in person to a doc. So proud of her. You know what's really odd? Chantix. Chantix can't be written over the phone. But well, Butrin can. And it is the exact same drug. It's bupurion. It's the same drug. It's it's just off label. Chantex. They're the same drug. That's bizarre. That's bizarre. Because I I get I get my uh, I get my bupurion and I get it through. Uh, maybe it's a Florida thing. I don't know. It's really weird. But they're they're getting weird. I'm telling you, they're getting weird. I'm sorry. It's Brazy Girl's birthday. Oh, I am I am ready to bust out a birthday song. I really am. Um, simply write uh, because it is your right, your power, your healing. Yeah, journal breakdowns, yes, of uh, possible angles and solutions and record every victory. Holy hell, did you read that? That's it, people, right there. I'm telling you. And you know what, Blake, you're a, you're a young guy. Wait, wait till you can go back a decade. Right. And read where you were in your dome and what you were doing. You know, that's a that's such a heavy thing. I uh, I was going back and uh, and reading in my. Uh, somebody's that I'm working with. Um, is struggling and they are uh, they're at about the uh, four or five month mark off opioids and really, really struggling. And I said, I'm going to get out my uh, my stuff and I'm going to see if I can't find where I was at. At four or five months, because he goes, you know, I'm just doing so bad. I said, I, I, I got to find my, <laughs> I got to find my journal stuff. And 
I read him a couple of pages of my of my journal entries, and I think he feels a lot better because <laughs> I wasn't doing so good at the uh, the four or five month mark. But you know what? To be able to go back and look at the stuff, right? Really is. It's epic. You're so right. Sorry for abruptly leaving last night. I was laughing so much, and then a cough attack. Oh no! Overwhelmed me for a couple hours. New inhaler. Oh no. Oh, and I'm sorry to hear that. I really am. Hope you weren't laughing. We didn't cause that. Although I'll tell you what, I was laughing pretty hard last night. And and I, I was laughing for a good hour after that was over. I immediately started watching that again. I went back and started watching it because I'm sorry. There was that's the funniest I've ever seen anybody react to anything. Reese really did turn into a Muppet last night. Like she just went and then exploded and her hands came up and just the ah! like it just nonstop. Oh, I love that person. It was one. One right after the other. She was cracking me up. She really was. But you know, when you laugh and you keep just that, the act of smiling for two hours, I promise you, man, it makes it really hard to go to bed. Your, your, the physiology, like your body starts going, oh, we're having a crap load of fun. I mean, things are good. Things are happening. This is fun. Maybe we should send down some brain chemicals, get them high a little bit. I'm not being funny, people. You realize this is, it's that simple. It really is. When you go, oh, I had so much fun at that party. Yeah, why do you think that was? Huh? That was your that was the reward center of your brain doing the right thing. You went to a party, you were surrounded by people, there was connection, good stuff was happening, and you were like, ooh, this is fun. That's your brain going. Yeah, here, have a little. Okay, a little brain chemical. Okay. Fun. The malfunctioning reward center of the brain can be realigned. So that things like hanging out with your kid, right? Teaching your kid to ride a bike, throw a football, pick a football, whatever. Those kinds of things start to release brain chemicals the way calling the dope man or watching his car pull into the parking lot of Walmart used to do for you. Eh? When you get realigned, right? That's why when we say... You get sober, man, that's not the end of the road, right? That's base camp. You just started this crap. It hasn't even begun to climb. I have many decades of journals. I look back and am, and am amazed. Sotheby's, uh, the changes in my, uh, oh yeah. Sotheby's, the, the changes in my lifetime. You know what? Uh, it's, I notice it not just in where I was and what I was doing, but the, um, the tone of voice. Yeah. The uh just the, the just the way that I sound, right? When I started journaling, uh, I had a crap load to say. But there was almost zero hope in anything that I wrote. Honestly, it was me calling Q bad names. <laughs> It was me. It was me cursing at Q and talking about why this isn't going to work, but I'm going to do it anyway, just so I can tell this idiot that this doesn't work. Like that was 90% of what I wrote for probably the first seven months. I was not particularly, but I got in the habit of writing. I'll tell you what, he always had something for me to do. I got in the habit of writing. I wanted to kill him about half of the time. Obviously not anymore, but. Yeah, you know what? I get that. I get that. It's um Tampa B. Be careful. I feel like you're skating really late at night. Please be careful. I suspect that you're really far back in the chat. Do you think? I love my kid. Either way, though, how is Q doing, Layla says? Uh, so um, the last update I think I gave on you guys uh, about Q. So I I had some, some speech deficits after my stroke. They were minor. And Becca Jean is here. Becca Jean, welcome back. Good to see you. Uh, yeah, it was one of those. Uh, so... When I had to learn to uh, to talk again, it was I had very little therapy I had to do. He's got to do a bunch. His body's perfect. He's working out. He's doing everything he was doing. His body's perfect, but he is struggling. Um, and I have yet to hear him 
he makes an attempt when he talks to his mom. When I correspond with him, all he does is type. And I see it on a screen that they got a device for him to use. Uh, because normally then you know they don't have those but he types so damn fast i think we get a lot more done with me talking as fast as i i can talk and him typing back as fast as he can type i think we actually get way more of 30 minutes of that than we ever got in 15 minutes of talking you're scaring me spanky the heck are you doing <laughs> my son was my son was doing the uh was the frightening look as he was typing it was yeah, he was he was mimicking a, a very frightening type He's doing well. He's learning. Uh, he's learning the sounds required. Uh, the first time I talked to him, he said he had the ST, the st sound down, and he was working on others. Um, whatever he does, whatever he does, he's going to nail it out quick. I promise. He's not a guy that's going to put this much in. Right. He's he's not a guy that has ever put a little bit of effort into anything. Mark Harden, thank you so much. It's appreciated, man. Uh, you know what? I've never been more sure of anything in my life. We're gonna get him out. Um I can't tell you all exactly uh, what's going on, but I'm getting ready there. I'm getting ready to go on a road trip. Got some things I gotta take care of. Uh, things are moving, things are progressing in the, in the right way. And I have spent a really good deal of, uh, of time dreaming about getting him out of prison. And I go through waves where sometimes I'm hopeful and sometimes it's hard to remain hopeful. Sometimes that's just a really difficult thing to do. But I can tell you right now, I have zero doubt. I, I see the path to getting him out and it's going to happen. Uh, even now I can tell what my mood is by how I write and what I write. Uh, if my works uh, are larger, oh, the words, yeah, if you start writing larger, I'm angry, smaller, venting, or just thoughts. Oh, I get angled. If I'm really, really pissed, that starts getting on a really rugged angle, right? If I'm having a good day and things are going right, my letters are, I mean, I, I write in scrawl. You would, nobody, none of you can read it. I promise you. Honestly, it looks more like hieroglyphics. I am. I really struggle with it. You would not. You. One of these days, I'll show it to you. It's it's hideous. I got really horrific penmanship. You'd be really really surprised. Man, I show there you are. How are you, my friend? My favorite people. Marissa Robinson, good to see you. Didn't do any of this this morning. There's the seventh. Um, thank you, Layla. I promise you, he's gonna get it. I promise you, he's going to get it. Um, yes, I do write like a physician. There's a lot of truth to that. In fact, whenever somebody would steal a uh, a prescription pad, it was a running joke. Be like, let Tommy write it, because I, if I was gonna, yeah. Anyway, Kristen Melinda, always a pleasure. Awakened by the Looking Glass. How are you? Uh, I think I can. I think that's gonna happen. I really do. Q called into a call with his mother two New Year's ago, but we all he could do was listen. We couldn't hear him. But I mean, they have rap albums that are built strictly off of verses good. recorded on jail phones. I'm sure that we can make that happen. I watched I watched a guy doing it when I was in prison. In fact, yeah, I talk about him a lot on the boat before. He was your age, exactly. And he lived next door to me. And he, he was the same age as my son. Bruce Osmond, good to see you. Purple Groovy 69, good to see you. Mary Jones, how are you? So listen, we've got about 15 minutes left, right? And now we got a full house. Let's talk about this truth thing. All right, let's back this up. Here's what we're not going to do here. We're not going to lie to one another. You understand? Well, Calhoun, I was in there seven years ago. A little old in the rap game. I was in there. This is seven years ago, Calhoun. You're right. 32 is a little old for the rap game. No question. That's an old man these days. We're not going to lie to one another. Right? My son is the, is the, uh, is the, the uh, mixer. He's my engineer here. Right? I do shows where I have to come on here and talk about how I was a shit dad, right? I'm looking at him while I'm saying that. 
promise we can come here and be uh, honest to one another, especially when you don't have to be <laughs> sitting in front of the camera. What's the biggest lie I ever told? Oh, my God. There's no way to even. I wouldn't know where to start, Layla. Um, I don't know that any were any bigger than the other. I mean, I. Well, let's see. I told an entire country that the uh, hundred dollar bill was being changed by the government uh, of the United States and that there was a chance sometime in the future where the hundred dollar bills that they had been saving as their life savings would no longer be worth anything. And I would be willing to buy those bills back from them at 80 cents on the dollar. That's a pretty big one. Right. And, uh, that brought in duffel bags full of hundred dollar bills, duffel bags. I'm not exaggerating. Duffel bags full of hundred dollar bills. You know what? Janet G. Spanx became an amazing human being in spite of himself. I mean, in spite of his dad, not because of his dad. Uh, you know what? I taught him a hell of a vocabulary. Spanks, did you block yourself? <laughs> okay, just joking. Yeah, that's a pretty big one. That's a pretty big one. Uh, I ran the I ran those ads in uh, in newspapers in a, in a foreign country, and then as they mailed their hundred dollar bills back to me in between two pieces of cardboard. For every hundred dollars that got mailed in, I'd keep a twenty and mail back eighty. Until I stopped doing that, and then just started keeping the hundreds. <laughs> that's because that's just kind of how things worked out back in the day. Um, yeah, it just got so out of control that anyway, we we tried to shut it down. You couldn't even shut it down. The envelopes just kept coming and coming and coming. Eventually, I got caught. You know, that's usually how it works. Um, I taught him. I, uh, it's really funny that you say that, uh, in order to start telling the truth, do you have to confess to confess your past lies? I don't know, Layla. I did. I did. Um, but I think it's different for every, I don't know if you, you know, I don't think I could answer that. Um, I don't think I could answer that question. Um, for you, but I can definitely answer it for me. And I know it's different for everybody. I really do know that that's different for everybody. But but for me, I had to own my past in order to build a new future. But I was starting from the ground up, Layla. There are people who told some lies to some people and maybe they need to make some amends. And then there are people who built their entire life on a lie where nothing about them is real, right? I was a, I was a businessman or I was this or I was that. I was a heroin addict. I was a just the dude that was slamming dope and whatever I was doing was just to get more dope. I didn't, there was no, yeah. I mean, that's just who I was. Uh, and, and for me, I had to, cause I was throwing all that out. Um, you know, you start thinking about, okay, I got a, something that someone sent to me. One of the crew members sent me today about being broken. And, uh, you start looking that, um, uh, well, thank you, Angie. I appreciate that. I did. I sent back a lot of 80s in the beginning, <laughs> um, but just in the beginning, it, uh, it definitely got really, really wildly out of control. Uh, Monica M., thank you. You look fantastic in green. Spanky, she doesn't look fantastic in green. Um, I uh, There was nothing about me that I wanted to say, right? And when your life is shattered... Right. And you think, you know, I need help. I need, you know, help me put the pieces of my life back together. The truth of the matter is more often than not, you're better off with the pieces of your life laying on the ground. Right. If your life is shattered into pieces like that, let let the pieces lay where they are. And then just work on whatever's still standing. Because chances are the shit that hit the ground, you didn't want anyway. For real. When we shatter our lives like that, it's usually. Yeah, Layla, you nailed it. 
you 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 get this desire to stop and you get a desire to fix it. You really do. I would run into people and people that you lied to and you just it's that's the it's like an earworm. Like you'd hear it in the back of your head going, Man, just tell them. Just tell this dude. Just tell this dude. Tell this dude. Tell until you finally are like, hey man. You remember that time? And you know what I found, which was really bizarre? What I found is that everybody knew I was full of crap anyway. I just I just thought people didn't know I was full of crap. But the entire world, the entire world was wildly on to me. That's the sad thing. Miss Sunrise Dawn. I am so sorry. I am so sorry. Oh, Miss Sunrise Dawn. I'm so sorry. I really am. I, uh, they're a family. They're family. I mean, there's just no, no other way to put it. I, uh, boy, I get that. I really do. You know, uh, my heart goes out to you more than I could possibly, uh, explain. Uh, you know what? I am blessed. I am blessed in that um, I don't, I saw that. I assumed that was him, Miss Sunrise Dawn. I assumed that was him. Uh, I'm blessed that I don't lie. I don't lie if I'm not on dope. It's just really not, not an issue. Uh, my lies stem from the desire to get more dope. It always came back to that. It always came back to I had to rip somebody off. I had to do whatever because I had to get more dope. And no matter how much I came up with, right? It's never enough. It's never enough. Um, Luann, well, we're very grateful that you found the lifeboat as well. We really are. Um, this is a, uh, it's a pretty amazing group of people. Lies are usually from shame. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think that's a big one. That's a big one. Um, as being one of the motivators of, uh, of dishonesty, but my, my dishonesty always came from, um, I knew that if I told the truth to anybody, they were going to try to get me to stop doing what I was doing. Right. And my biggest fear on earth was that I was going to have to stop doing dope. What if someone asks you to keep a secret? Is lying by omission acceptable? Serious question about your perspective. No, I'll tell you exactly what my perspective is on this. Uh, I talk to people every day who tell me things in confidence. And then I will say to someone else, there's no omission. I will say to you, oh, I, I, I know. I know exactly what's up. Person told me. I'm not telling you. If somebody tells me something in confidence, I'll go to the grave with it. Right? I'll tell you something. If you got a problem keeping a secret, go do some time. I promise you, they'll cure you of that shit quick. Quick. You'll see someone else who didn't keep a secret long before you ever screw up. You'll see it happen to somebody else. And very often they get these really unbelievable marks right here on both sides of their face. That um, the kind of marks you're not wiping off. Right. It's uh, people take that crap really seriously on the inside. Um, I can't talk to people and do what I do. If people think that I'm going to talk about what they tell me, there are some people that, um, that I talk to who, uh, who are dealing with some really, really heavy, heavy things in their life. And they got to be able to believe that whatever they're going to tell me, I'm not going to tell anybody, you know? And I'll tell you what, people who have been on the boat a long time know just how, uh, how incredible that is because Mark wages and I, someone would be writing to Mark or somebody would be talking to me. And then inevitably they were like, well, someone would call Mark and they'd go, Hey, listen, I want to talk about, and they would splurt out whatever they told me two days earlier. And Mark would go, good God, what happened? The hell are you talking about? 
And they'd be like, oh, well, you know, I told Tommy. And he'd be like, yeah, Tommy and I don't talk about anything that you sent to Tommy. And I'm the, if you send something to me, he and I aren't talking about it either. You know, like we were, we're pretty serious about that crap, man. I don't think you can do what I do if you're not serious about that. I got I to gotta fix this for you one more time. Right? That's in the real world. Snitches get stitches, right? Inside, they say snitches get ditches, right? With a day. As in the following day, they're not going to be on this side of the divot, right? They're going to be on, on the bottom side of the divot. People who people who like to tell on people in prison get killed. I mean, for real, it's just how it works. They take that crap more seriously than just about anything else. You really got to learn to keep your uh, to keep your mouth shut. Um, oh yeah, being told a secret is completely different than telling somebody a lie. Absolutely. Now, omission is something else. I, let me give you a perfect example, right? Um, if I'm, let's say, uh, if your if your significant other says, hey. Uh, you know, you didn't take the car and go to so-and-so's, did you? And you say, no, no, I didn't. Do it. Because you actually took the car and went somewhere else. That's one of those BS kind of omission lies, right? Well, you didn't ask me if I went to, oh, no, no, right? The, the, any of those, I don't do BS, right? Just BS in general, for real. If I tell you, if I tell you you're looking beautiful, you're looking beautiful. I don't BS people. I gave it up. I know that if I start with the small ones, and I hurt people's feelings on the regular, I really do. I'm, I'm a little rough around the edges. Is what it is, man. You know what? The people who get to know me realize that every once in a while, man, it's just kind of, I apologize in advance if I ever say anything that's going to offend you. But I, I had to go with default setting one way or the other, you feel me? And I kind of defaulted to, I'm just going to be a little bit more honest than the next guy. Right. So don't ask me a question you don't want another friggin' answer to because I'm going to end up telling you. <laughs> it's going to bum me out. Thank you, Cal. Thank you, man. I, I love you. I really do. I got a great kid. Thank you, B. Hendricks. That's solid, man. See, I dig that. That's solid. Yeah. Ah. Mr. <laughs> Miss Dragon, we're getting to, we're getting to that point. We used to tell each other secrets. We're, neither of us will remember that we told each other. You won't remember what I said. I don't remember what you said. It's perfect, for real. I think what was it? Uh, I think it was Benjamin Franklin that said three people. I mean, uh, yeah, three people can keep a secret as long as two of them are dead, or one is Miss Dragon and one is Tommy. Then three people can keep a secret. Start getting a little long in the tooth. You start getting a little older. Starts getting a little tougher. Cinderella's glass slipper. This is love and hugs to all who need it tonight. You know what? Everybody needs this tonight. I do. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. Oh, my God. I had, I had, a, uh, I had a moment with my dad. That was just one of the most unbelievable things. Uh, I mean, honestly, just blow your mind kind of things. But my dad said to me, uh, come on by the house. I was, uh, I had gotten out of prison for bank robbery and uh, I was married at the time. But he goes, yeah, come by. So I went by the house and uh, I went in and uh, he goes, sit down. And I said, hey, is something wrong? He goes, no, but I wanted to ask you some questions and I want you to tell me the truth. And I said, don't ask me anything that you don't want to know the uh, the answer to, because I'm I'm done I'm done lying. And uh, it was really funny stuff. You know what I mean? It really was because he was like because before I went to prison, he said to me, you know, did you really rob these banks? I said, no, I didn't rob any banks. And I said, I got you know this is a setup, and I kind of went, <laughs> you, know, you just tell the lies. You're embarrassed or whatever. And so when I got out, you know, I was sober, and um, I went over there, and he's like, so. Did you really rob that bank? I said, no, I did not rob that bank. He said, okay. He goes, good, because when you told me, I said, well, I robbed a crap load of other banks. <laughs> like, I just didn't rob that one. You know, I robbed a bunch of banks, but I didn't rob that one. I said, I just went to prison for that one because they couldn't get me for the banks that I did rob. So they got me for one that, they, that I didn't. It's kind of a messed up thing, but, but we sat in that uh, kitchen and he asked me stories. 
And then he would say, remember when you told me this, this, or this? And I'd go, uh, yeah, I lied about that. Or he'd go, you remember that time? I'd go, yeah, that was bullshit. You know, and, and we just did this for a long enough. But each time I said it, I felt so bad. But about 10 minutes in, he just started laughing. And he'd go, oh, wait. He goes, trip to Australia. I go, oh, man. And I, and I told him the story about what really happened on that trip. And he was just, I mean, he was laughing so hard. He really was. The two of us were just laughing. And I thought, oh, that's great. Because it was uh, it was a moment. And I'm glad that I, uh, I got a chance to share it. My, uh, when my dad left planet Earth, there were no secrets between us. I hadn't lied to him about anything. Oh, yeah. Oh, Kristen, he was wise to all of it. He didn't like like the Australia thing. He looked at me and he goes, uh, I know the story you told me about Australia, why you went there and all that was complete and utter BS. And I was like, yeah, it was. He didn't know what the truth was. You know, when I said to him, no, I flew over there with like 28 ounces of cocaine in my uh, cowboy boots. <laughs> you know, that's that's not where he thought I was going with that. He looked at me and just went, you were smuggling cocaine? I was like, yeah. He's like, oh, wow. Yeah, it's not where I thought you were going. It's like, that's, that's not what I thought at all. I guess my dad thought I was over there. I don't know, hurting somebody for money or something. But uh, he didn't think I was over there uh, smuggling smuggling blow, which is really what uh, what brought me there. But there was a, a bunch of uh, a bunch of things like that, you know, uh, times where, yeah, tall cowboy boots to be sure. Tall cowboy boots. Uh, it was wildly cathartic. If you want to know the truth, Layla, it really was. And it was so hard in the beginning. Like the first three truths just suck so bad. Like I could, I could taste bile in the back of my throat. You know what I mean? Like, and there were tears welling up. But, but right around the time he laughed, like he said to me, he goes, when you said you robbed a bunch of banks, he's like, three or four of them or what? <clears throat> I go, it was a little more than three or four. And he goes, like, was, it, was it more than seven or eight? I said, it was more than a dozen. He just started to laugh. And, and I mean, that was it. Like, <laughs> you know, the first couple were ugly. Once he started to, uh, to laugh. Uh, yeah, Carol G, I did. I saw that uh, three boys under the age of 16 robbed a bank. And, uh, I mean, and there's nothing's going to happen to them. Nothing is going to happen to them. Um, although, you know, it's funny. The 16 year old would have been better robbing a bank at 18. At 16, he's probably going to get put in a youth defender program until he's 25. Where if he had waited until he was like 17, he probably could have gone to the feds and been out in three years. So honestly, it, was, it wasn't the greatest move for him. But the other two, you know, a lot of gangs put kids up to stuff like this because they know they're not going to do time. So you're moving to Arizona after the cruise. Really? Is that because of me? We got a lot of people. I I was salty to find out how many people like Ben Turner came out, you know, um, Shelly Kelly came out. There were, there were, there were a bunch of people that we got to meet, which was awesome. Uh, but boy, there's a bunch of you in, uh, in Tucson that didn't come out to meet me. Did I ever keep a secret from my parents? Because somebody asked me to, uh, yeah, yeah, I did. But not sober. I did when I was on drugs. Yeah. Uh, my, my brother Johnny was always asking me to hide something from my parents. Uh, when my dad caught me smoking, he said, I'm so disappointed in you. Oh, man. The good. When I called my dad from rehab and he said, I'm so proud of you. How good is that? How good is that? I'll tell you one. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end with this one because it's going to ruin me. But I'll do this one anyway. But I'll end with this one. Uh, my dad stayed alive to see me sober. He did. He fought viciously. Because he didn't want me to die. I mean, he didn't want to die when I was in prison. For real. I mean, he came back from the dead. Can't tell you how many times. Especially like right near the end, man. They, I would call from prison and they would be like, this is it. You know, he's not going to make Monday. And, and then I'd call home four days later because we were on a lockdown. I'd call him four days later and he'd answer the phone. <laughs> what the hell's going on? He's like, yeah, I was in the hospital. I came home. He's like, you know, things are better. Just, but 
I talked to him the day the day he died. I talked to him on the phone and he said to me, I want you to know, there's not a doubt in my mind you're going to stay sober. And I said, I am. And he goes, no, no. He goes, well, you always say that. He said, but I, I believe you. And I think he just, he was waiting for that, uh, for that belief, you know. But uh, there was, there was a, a really great moment there where he just said, you know, I'm proud of you. And I believe wholeheartedly that you're, uh, you're going to stay sober. And he went off happy as hell to go die and, and told me he was going to, you know, he said, this is it. This is the last time we talk. I'm going to die tonight. I mean, he, he was absolutely completely at peace and cool with it. You know, the first time he said it, I go, Hey, don't say shit like that. Come on, man. And he goes, Oh no, no, no I'm not bummed out about it. He said, but this is it. He said, I'm, I'm not going to fight this tonight. And he just was fighting it. He was fighting it every night. And I think that last night he was, he was just at peace and, he went up and laid down to sleep and didn't get up. He was stoked about it. I uh, I really would like the idea of going out that route, you know? I, I think we probably all would like to go out that route, whether or not that uh, that works out. But All right, see this? Ah, right there is a feline in a basket. Look at her. She looked evil. She is. Don't let her fool you. This cat. I'm telling you. Just a little secret. I'm probably going to be. Uh, I'm probably going to be doing a little filming from uh, from an airport here. In what seems like a few freaking hours. <laughs> Got way too much time in airports. What do you think, Calhoun? I think <clears throat> you've earned a good old rest. Yeah. It's this seems like old times, right? Me, like a uh, bunch of rests. Yeah, it does seem like old times. Me, me cruising to the airport every other day. Thank Blind you, Layla. hungry. Yeah, uh, thank you. I, I wish it was a flight. I think it's probably going to be about 14 of them. You know why, right? Seriously. If somebody says, well, no, I'm not taking a flight. I'm taking 14 flights. You can pretty much bank on the fact that they're flying southwest. Sorry if I'm <laughs> stepping on anybody's toes, but good God, man. Like you got to deplane before you even get on a plane. As I'm in the parking lot, I'm gonna have to deplane. You know, get on a plane. <laughs> it's it's so friggin' bad, Calvin. I was looking at the itinerary. I'm like, good God, dude, for real. Like you fly from from Tucson to Phoenix, right? From Phoenix to Dallas, from Dallas to Houston, from Houston to there had to have been like nine layovers. I'm looking at all of them, going, wouldn't have flown on Delta. You're gonna no. spend all day traveling. Um, every time you're on Southwest, you're spending all day traveling. I don't care if you're going from Reno to Vegas, four, four stopovers, at least going one through O'Hare or Denver. Yeah. I didn't have, a, I didn't have any control over this one. I didn't buy it. I wouldn't have done it. I don't, uh, you ever just, just ride so, the bus for fun? Have I ever rid, ridden the bus for fun? Cause you're about to all <laughs> over the country. Go oh, little diesel therapy. Yeah. Little diesel therapy. Uh, lot the last 48 hours on the boat has been amazing. Kimberly, what a cool thing to say. And look, I, I, Cricket is my only travel agent. If I was buying this, Tick Cricket would have, uh, would have bought it. I didn't buy this. This had nothing to do with me. I do have a new, uh, travel agent. If I had, I'm telling you, if I had bought this, you would have, I did not buy this. I didn't buy this. If I'm buying it, and if I'm buying, listen, you want to hear a really safe rule of thumb? If Tommy's traveling on Southwest, somebody bought Tommy an airline ticket. Feel me? Because if I'm buying an airline ticket, I'm spending enough money to have a, my name, I mean, my number on the seat. I want to know what seat I'm in before I leave. I like that. It's civilized. It feels like air travel. That crap where we're all going moo like cows and getting up into those stalls. What in sweet God is that? What? Seriously, that's not right. It's uncivilized, man. Uncivilized. Uncivilized. Look at that paw. Look at that paw. I do pack snacks. I'm really... Oh, speaking of which. Hold that thought. Yeah, 
Do you see this? Do you know what this is? Calhoun, you know what this is. Every one of these balls is two grams of protein. They weigh absolutely nothing. They're freeze dried, and every one of them is two grams of protein. It is, it is my secret diet aid. It is how I have lost uh, my weight. It is how I am. I overload my body with protein. An army's worth. You know what? I'm testing it. it. Looks like fruity pebbles. Does it not? It looks exactly like fruity pebbles, but they have zero uh, weight. They're they're freeze dried, so they're like they're lighter than air. Um, they've got no, um, all it is is protein. There's nothing else in it. It's just protein. It's, uh, <laughs> half, you know what, half, I love you. You are, um, I was, as soon as I said protein balls, I was looking for half. Um, I don't know exactly how much this costs yet. The people that, the people who own this product, I'm trying to get this private labeled for the boat. I want this cheaper than they charge. So we're working on this right now. I am working on this, people. I want this private label for the boat or I want a product for us that is cheap enough that, but I've been on this. I should I should, I should, should show you guys the new bod because I swear to you, you would not recognize me. I am I'm in shape. Calhoun, am I in shape? I'm in shape. I'll, uh, I'll show you after my business trip. But um, yeah, so uh, I will be... Uh, talking to um i will be talking to all of you from the road what kind of protein you have choice you have a choice you can go uh one of three directions with that you can go you can go animal you can go no animal or you can go a combo of the both what are you doing well, yeah i'm afraid you're not allowed to ask that hey you can't prove that cricket Knock that off. You can't prove it's soil and green. Okay. All right, people. We'll see you on the next one. I'm Captain Tommy. Bye-bye. Love you.